All right, awesome. Well then, um, I just want to take a moment uh, to welcome you to Wakasa's uh, webinar, one of Wakasa's webinars in our series this year. Um, I'm Jesse Corcoran. I am the Training and Technical Assistance Coordinator here at Wakasa, and we are really, really thrilled uh, to finally have and present to you a webinar on suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. Um, really excited to have with us Leah Rolando here today. She's a suicide prevention specialist through the Mental Health America of Wisconsin. Um, I had a great pleasure actually of meeting her at a training uh, a couple months ago and uh, you know immediately drew the connection that we needed to bring her in to do this webinar um, as we get so many different requests, especially from sexual assault advocates who are like, hey, uh, you know, I, we've been dealing with uh, survivors who are having suicidal ideation, for example, and, you know, we're still tr struggling to make sure that we're, you know, supporting them, giving them the resources and services that they need, and, and how should I be handling that? So, again, really excited to have Leah with us here today. Um, as a quick note, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat throughout the webinar. Um, Peter and I will try to monitor that chat and um, when we can and when there's a break in, in Leah's pre presentation, we can um, insert ourselves and, and make sure that we get your questions asked. Um, but there's also going to be time for questions at the end of the webinar as well, so we can take some more questions then. Um, so yeah, feel free to, to type in the chat as you will throughout the webinar. And um, I don't know, Peter, is there anything else we need to mention before we get started? No, nope, I think you covered it. Thanks. All right, awesome. Well then, oh, and I guess maybe we should just also mention if anyone's having technical difficulties, if you can't you know, hear things, if, if something happens, please also type into the chat uh, or email Peter. We can um, try to keep uh, tabs on that and make sure that we can support you with technology if you're having any issues today. Um, and without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Leah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse, and thanks for um, the interest in this topic. Um, so again, like Jesse said, I work for Mental Health America of Wisconsin as the suicide prevention specialist. Um, I do lead our statewide coalition called Prevent Suicide Wisconsin, and we're kind of an umbrella coalition over um, all of the different county coalitions throughout the state. So there are um, some active coalitions in different counties. Um, and I'll walk us through the Prevent Suicide Wisconsin website later so that I can familiarize um, you all with our resources. So that's kind of the hub for all the resources there. Um, I am also a crisis text line volunteer. Um, so that number that you hear about, the 741741, um, it's a national crisis text line and I am one of the volunteers for that. So could also answer questions about it. And I also um, do QPR instructor, um, QPR trainers. Um, so I work as a QPR instructor providing question, persuade, refer, gatekeeper trainings. Those are free. Um, we also have a list of um, trainers throughout the state if you are interested in more information or bringing this to another organization. Um, so that's briefly who I am. Um, I also have my email listed there. So if you have questions afterwards that weren't answered on here or you wanna save them for later, we can have an individual follow-up uh, conversation after this webinar. There we go. Okay. Um, so just a note about taking care of yourself. So this is a webinar. We're not really all in person. And so it is hard to check in on each other, but I just want to let everyone know it's important to take care of yourself. Um, the presentation, you know, we're talking about suicide, so it can bring up difficult and painful feelings. So do whatever works best for you um, in terms of taking care of yourself. If you need to check out for a minute and then check back in, totally fine. And I have my little flower people up here to remind everyone to check in on uh, one another so we can take care of ourselves. So this is the Wisconsin Suicide Prevention Strategy. This one was released in 2015 and we are currently in the process of updating the 2019 Wisconsin Suicide Prevention Strategy, which will soon be called um, Suicide in Wisconsin Impact and Response. So rather than two separate documents, a report and a strategy will have merged these and it should be a more accessible document for folks to flip through and think about what prevention efforts could be going on in their communities. <clears throat> so if you want to chat about that later, if you're interested in contributing to the report, 
I fully welcome that. We're doing stakeholder feedback, listening sessions. Um, I can have follow-up conversations um, to update this new report. We really just want it to be helpful for everyone and not super academic or super research-based, but just helpful for people in your communities. So broadly, the goals will remain the same. Uh, number one is about protective factors. Number two is about access to care. Um, that can be mental health services and peer services. Um, number three is about healthcare system best practices. That's a lot to do with our zero suicide initiative in Wisconsin. And then number four is about data monitoring and evaluation. So basically, you know, we're doing all this work, but what is the data that we're collecting on attempts and deaths by suicide in Wisconsin? And then what's the data on the programs that we're, we're doing? So for example, you know, is this webinar effective? Are we collecting data on what trainings are working to educate people on suicide prevention? So that's kind of a broad overview of what frames our prevention efforts in Wisconsin. And then I have the link down there um, PreventSuicideWI.org uh, backslash our work. You can learn more about the steering committee and what informs um, this work on a statewide level. So I wanted to also give you an example of a coalition throughout the state. Um, Prevent Suicide Greater Milwaukee or PSGM is only one of the coalitions um, that exist, but this is kind of an example of what coalitions do. We provide the QPR suicide prevention trainings and training of trainers so that more folks can become instructors and do trainings in schools, their faith communities, um, with law enforcement, all different types of groups. We offer post pension support and consultation. So when there is a death by suicide in a community or a school, we can come in and talk to the faculty, staff, and students about how to respond to that death and how to best support um, people going through that grieving process. We do youth resilience programming, uh, means restriction, we distribute gun locks and dr drug disposal kits, and we also advertise drug take back days. And then lastly, um, we have quarterly coalition partner meetings. I know other coalitions do this as well, um, bringing folks together to teach about suicide prevention, provide resources, and then highlight lived experience. So lived experience in the context of suicide prevention is anyone who has experienced a suicide attempt, a suicide loss, or lives with suicidal thoughts, um, just making sure that we're elevating those voices and that lived experience remains centered in this conversation. Um, an important note, um, none of the coalitions actually provide crisis intervention or direct services. Um, we do more education, consultation, um, and resource sharing. So we're connected to the folks who do crisis intervention, but that will vary um, county to county. All right. So language matters. There are a lot of documents on this, and this is always evolving as we learn more about suicide and we learn more about um, person first language as well. So um, these are some examples of what to say, what not to say, and then the rationale behind that. So we could say non-fatal or made an attempt on their life, um, but do not say unsuccessful or successful suicide um, because that normalizes or glamorizes a suicide attempt. Um, you could say take their own life or ended their own life rather than successful or completed and then died by suicide or deaths by suicide rather than commit um, or commit suicide. Um, and that why, that's a big one. I know folks are you know, having this conversation around kind of shifting from commit to died by or died of. Um, and that's really important so that we avoid the association between suicide and a crime or a sin. And then lastly, this one's really important for the media. Um, we really encourage media folks to talk about concerning rates of suicide or number of deaths rather than a suicide epidemic or um, skyrocketing rates or um, any of that really dramatic language um, to avoid the sensationalism and inaccuracy. So we know that suicide is on the rise, the rates are on the rise, um, but we know that calling it an epidemic and saying startling and you know, dramatic words like that um, can have the opposite effect in the media. It's not very prevention focused um, and it kind of creates fear rather than providing tips about what, what we can do to prevent suicide. So I can pause. One quick question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, what does youth resilience mean? Good question. So I mentioned youth resilience on the um, PSGM slide. So we support programs like Hope Squad, um, Sources of Strength, 
signs of suicide, all of those are um, pretty youth resilience based. So working with kids in groups, peer to peer groups on what does it mean to be resilient? What are your protective factors? How do we build those up? And I'll get to a slide about protective factors a little bit later, um, but that's specifically working with the schools um, in conjunction with some of their trauma informed care programs um, and making sure that um, youth resilience is in all of the programs that we have in schools. I don't know if that helps. I, I mentioned a couple programs, so I can provide more information as you'd like it. Thanks. Yep. Awesome. Some data. Um, this is an overview of suicide in Wisconsin. Again, I mentioned the new report will be coming out um, later in 2019, so we'll have updated numbers. So I didn't include any very specific numbers right now because those were all from 2015. But we do know Wisconsin is generally above the national average for suicide among men and women. We know rates and numbers are highest among men in their middle years. So that's in Wisconsin and also uh, nationally. And rates for women have been up um, the past two years. Again, so this is from 2015, so that was uh, 2013 and 2014. And we know that that continues to rise. Um, a note about the rates and numbers being highest among men in the middle years, we know that men are more likely to attempt suicide um, using lethal means, so using guns more often than women, um, but women do attempt more frequently. Um, so I know that's kind of a confusing data point, um, but I just wanted to share that clarification piece. <clears throat> we know that youth rates do fluctuate quite a bit. Um, so we want to use caution in interpreting, especially when the media is reporting on youth rates, um, because we know suicide is still pretty uncommon among youth. So when there are, say, you know, three suicides in a month, you see a pretty big spike. Um, and we know that fluctuates a lot. We know rates are highest uh, for white people, but small numbers make rates for other races and ethnic groups unstable. Um, so we know there's a lot of work to do there around data collection um, and also um, targeting our prevention efforts to not be a one size fits all. Rates are generally higher in northern, western, and northeastern regions of Wisconsin. That is also consistent with national data that the rates are higher in rural areas. Um, on the Prevent Suicide Wisconsin website, we have suicide rates by county, so you can break that down. There's a giant spreadsheet and look up your specific county and what the rates are there. And we do um, update that often. And lastly, firearms are consistently the most utilized means of death. Um, so we do need to have the conversation around guns and suicide and um, what can we do to keep people safe if you are high risk um, temporarily, you know, do you need to have a gun in the home um, and have conversations like that? So that's an overview of suicide in Wisconsin. Um, pause for a second if there are any questions. Okay. Not, not that I see right now. All right. So moving on to communities at disproportionate risk, I know some more numbers, um, some more data, and I promise I will get into the um, prevention pieces, but still, I really want to give you an overview of what, um, what we're looking at. We're talking about the scope of the problem. So we know that the rate of suicide is four times greater for lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth, and two times greater for questioning youth compared to straight youth. And we know ideation and attempts are much higher. And so the data for this, um, is national and then the ideation slash attempts are much higher comes from the youth risk behavior survey. So folks might be familiar with YRBS data um, that's collected every other year and schools op like opt in to having their students um, take this survey. So questions on that survey related to suicide um, talk about have you attempted um, you have suicidal thoughts, and then they collect demographics so that we can have a picture of what um, ideation and attempts look like for all different um, populations. 40% um, of transgender adults have made a suicide attempt, and we know that 92% of those attempts occurred before the age of 25. Um, so we know resources like the Trevor Project and the Trans Lifeline are really important resources that need funding and that need to continue to exist so that it can meet 
on the needs of the LGBTQ and specifically the trans population. We know that people of color, both adults and children, are less likely than white counterparts to receive needed mental health care. And we know that every day in America, 22 veterans die by suicide. So again, if we had the time, we could, um, there's so much research on all different identities and all different populations, and we could have a presentation on each of these, but I'm just, again, giving you a quick overview of the communities at disproportionate risk of suicide. Um, to give you, yeah, give you an idea of what this looks like. And then the second slide, um, communities at disproportionate risk. We mentioned men in their middle years, um, so stressors that challenge those traditional male roles, for example, unemployment or divorce, have been identified as important risk factors. And also, I mentioned that although men die more often by suicide because of lethal means, women do attempt more frequently. Um, we know the historical trauma suffered by American Indians and Alaska Natives, for example, resettlement, destruction of cultures and economies also contributes to a high suicide rate. And lastly, Latina teens have the highest rate of suicide attempts um, at 15% among all groups in the U.S. And so if you have any questions about any of these, any of the sources, I can share um, some of the research that I have um, so we can connect later too if you have questions there. All right, so we know that the likelihood that a person suffers suicidal or depressive thoughts increases after sexual violence. So these statistics are from RAIN. Um, so you can see here 94% of women who are raped experience symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder during the two weeks following. We know 30% of women report symptoms of PTSD nine months after the rape. And then 33% of women who are raped con contemplate suicide, and 13% of women who are raped attempt suicide. So those are pretty, um, pretty high statistics. I think you know it's kind of obvious when we're we're looking at this data that it kind of makes sense. But also, you know, there's so much more research that needs to be done, um, and so much more um, intentionality in some of our prevention efforts to be asking about suicide when something traumatic happens. So I have the link there on the bottom where those statistics came from. So I mentioned the YRBS. This is, again, the Wisconsin Youth Risk Behavior Survey from 2017. All of this can be found on the Department of Public Instruction website. Um, these are just a couple, this is a screenshot, and then a line pulled from um, a report that Kate McCoy put together. You know, students who are exposed to violence and aggression are also at much higher risk of suicidal behavior. So that's attempts. Um, then in the graph, you can see students who attempted suicide report higher victimization rates. So the blue on the left is attempted suicide, 48.4%. And then the green, I'm sorry, the blue represents experienced sexual or dating violence and the green is experienced bullying slash cyberbullying. So you can see that graph there. Um, so the leading theory of suicide um, was put together by Thomas Joyner. Um, he wrote a book in 2007 called Why People Die by Suicide. He has done a lot of research and continues to research why people die by suicide. Um, and this is, Kind of the leading theory, it is being challenged by some other theories, but right now um, this is kind of what frames a lot of the prevention efforts, so targeting these three spheres. So you can see thwarted belongingness basically translates into I am alone, perceived burdensomeness translates into I am a burden, and then capability for suicide uh, would translate into I am not afraid to die. So maybe someone has attempted before and that fear has decreased a little bit. But when those three intersect and you have a desire um, for suicide or a desire to die, that is when a suicide or a near lethal suicide attempt occurs. So if we look at those and kind of flip them, um, what are we doing to create belonging? What are we doing to let people know that they're not a burden? Um, and how do we do means restriction too? So um, making sure we have bridge barriers, making sure we have locks for guns. Um, having conversations that are kind of hard talking about that piece of suicide prevention, but it's really important when people are in crisis to make sure that they're safe. 
some myths, um, and these are taken from the QPR training. Um, if folks are familiar with question persuade refer, um, a myth is that confronting a person about suicide will only make them angry and increase their risk of suicide. But research shows that that's actually false. Asking someone directly about their suicidal intent lowers their anxiety and opens up communication and actually lowers the risk of them attempting suicide. And this isn't to say that, you know, it's going to be easy. It's going to be easy to have that conversation because a lot of times it's not. Um, and someone might be initially angry, um, you know, if you ask them about suicide and say that, you know, I've already called 911 and had this whole intervention. In, but it's still when you know that somebody is at super high risk, which we'll get into, um, it's really important to make sure they're safe um, and surround them with the support that's available. Um, second myth is only experts can prevent a suicide. You know, people look to me a lot as the suicide prevention specialist and assume that I know so much more than they do, but that's not, you know, necessarily true. Um, it's really about relationships at the end of the day. Um, and we know that preventing suicide, or that says prevention in there, but preventing suicide is everyone's business and that a relationship with the person can make a huge difference. So really it's not all these, you know, huge, um, large scale intervention. Um, it's about asking someone and being comfortable with asking someone if they're thinking about death or dying or suicide and then staying with them to hear that answer and then walking with them to get resources. All right, so a few risk factors, and risk factors are different than warning signs. So I just have this in bold and italicized at the top, that risk factors are characteristics of a person or their environment that increase the likelihood that a person will die by suicide. That's risk. Um, so those are prior suicide attempts. We know that um, a suicide attempt does put pers a person at higher risk for reattempting um, misuse or abuse of alcohol or other drugs. Um, any type of um, mental illness, specifically though depression or other mood disorders. Um, and we know in youth, um, increasingly ADD and ADHD are also risk factors um, for suicide, especially when you're talking about impulsivity um, and like the developing brain. So more research should be done to be done there, but I do want to bring that up because a lot of folks think, you know, depression is the is the like precursor for suicide, but sometimes it could be anxiety, sometimes it could be ADD or ADHD. Um, a risk factor is access to lethal means, um, knowing someone who died by suicide, so being a survivor of loss yourself, social isolation, um, chronic disease and disability, and also lack of access to behavioral health care. So again, thinking back to our Wisconsin suicide prevention strategy, we know these risk factors and we know if we flip them, um, to mitigate them, we can actually prevent suicide. So I do want to um, obviously talk about and emphasize protective factors. So protective factors are personal or environmental characteristics that help protect people from suicide. So like I said, you know, we talked about lack of access to care. Um, we know a protective factor is actually effective behavioral health care. Um, we know that another protective factor is connectedness to individuals, um, family, community, and social institutions. So sometimes that could be a faith community, sometimes just a social group. Any way you can connect people to other people is going to be the number one most preventative thing when we're talking about suicide. Um, another protective factor, life skills. So including problem solving skills and coping skills, ability to adapt to change. A lot of these are being woven into the new um, Department of Public Instruction, social, emotional, learning resources, uh, making sure teachers know how to talk about these things with students. Um, continuing on, self-esteem and a sense of purpose or meaning in life. And then lastly, cultural, religious, or personal beliefs that discourage suicide. And we know um, a lot of times religion or faith could be a protective factor. Um, but it is not always, especially when we're talking about LGBTQ youth um, or environments um, where, where youth aren't able to be fully themselves. So I, I see this as a piece that's kind of missing as a you know, side note to the cultural, religious, or personal beliefs part. Um, but we still do know that for the majority, um, 
having you know the sense of belonging or a sense of a faith community could be a protective factor. Moving on to warning signs. So this is the part of recognizing if somebody um, is thinking about suicide. So I'll start on the right hand side of the slide with serious risk and then I'll move to the left and talk about immediate risk. So serious risk, um, and I think a lot of us have heard these things a lot. You know, the media is getting better about talking about the warning signs. So people are starting to kind of memorize, you know, what these warning signs are. But I'll go through some of them. Um, talking about feeling, or I'm sorry, talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain or about being a burden to others. So if folks are familiar with Kevin Hines, um, he survived a suicide attempt from the Golden Gate Bridge, and he talks about in his documentary and some YouTube videos that he has um, feeling caught in this unbearable pain and feeling like a burden on his friends and family. And so I think he is a great example of talking about you know, these things. I think anybody um, who has attempted suicide can kind of reference these things as well, but um, Kevin Hines is a really good resource and goes around speaking and doing events. Um, increasing the use of alcohol or other drugs, um, acting anxious or agitated, behaving recklessly. Oftentimes, like I mentioned about depression, it, it's not always you know, feeling sad or feeling depressed. Um, it's also acting anxious or agitated, especially um, with young boys who are noticing that reckless behavior could be a precursor for a suicide attempt. And then some things that are a little less obvious, so sleeping too little or too much, um, withdrawing or feeling isolated, showing rage or talking about seeking revenge, and then extreme mood swings. So anytime you notice a major change in behavior, um, I think it's important to have that follow-up conversation with someone and ask them if they're thinking about suicide. So moving to the left side, under immediate risk, um, these might seem a little obvious as well, but talking about wanting to die or kill oneself. And again, it's important to, even if someone might be joking or frame it as joking, to still kind of break through that and ask someone if they really mean that, um, rather than kind of challenging that immediately. I think it's always important to challenge problematic language, but also, um, you know, people thinking about suicide may communicate those thoughts as, as jokes and lightheartedly like that. Um, looking for a way to kill oneself, such as searching online or obtaining a gun. Um, we work really closely with Chuck Loveless and the Gun Shop Project. So he um, is from Mount Horeb, has a gun shop, and learned that um, there were a couple people who went to his shop and didn't know a ton about guns, but then bought a gun and actually used the gun to end their lives. And so he finally, you know, talked about what if there was a way to prevent this? What if we could actually have a conversation with someone when they're in that crisis moment? Um, and what are, the, what are the warning signs that they're showing? So he figured out that one of the warning signs was, you know, looking for a gun and not really knowing how to use it. So now there are um, kind of safety contra or, uh, safety plans that he does with folks. Um, and I can share more information about that, that too. I mean, there's a lot of work being done around that, but that could be a presentation <laughs> in and of itself. So I'll stop there for now, but the Gunshot Project is a really great resource. Um, and lastly, talking about feeling hopeless or having no reason to live um, is a risk factor or a warning sign for suicide. All right, so I mentioned being um, a crisis counselor on the crisis text line. So I wanted to show a variety of ways to respond to suicide. Um, so I'll start with this assessment and then I'll move on to a little more intense assessments because I'm not sure exactly where everybody is in terms of protocol if somebody tells you they're thinking about suicide. So this is what we're trained to do on the crisis text line. Um, we have a conversation with someone and someone might say, I just feel like disappearing. And so we're prompted to ask something like, um, when you say you want to disappear, do you mean you're thinking of suicide? And sometimes you could ask about death and dying rather than suicide to kind of get at the same thing, but then ultimately still do ask about suicide. So that, um, that assesses for thoughts, then you would move on to plan. So depending on what you know, they say back to you, you would say, thank you for your honesty. Um, do you have a plan for how you would kill yourself? So making sure, um, well not making sure, but asking them and checking in about 
yes, you have thoughts, but now do you have a plan? Depending on what they would say to that, you would move down and ask about means, so access to means. It sounds like you've thought about this. Do you have access to X to do Y? So whatever they told you about their plan, um, ask if they have the means to carry out that plan. And then finally, and this is if they say yes to this final one, um, this is when we on the crisis text line would flag our supervisors and they would initiate an active rescue. So calling either local law enforcement, 911, or um, if they have a mobile crisis team um, initiating that, that active rescue. So lastly, asking about time frame, um, say it's brave of you to share that with me. Do you have a time plan for when you would do X? So this is Pretty simple when you think about thoughts, plan, means, time frame. It's just four steps, and we know it's imminent risk after they say yes to all four. So this is something you could easily, you know, make a card out of or just like hang up in a cubicle um, and reference as your ladder up risk assessment for suicidal thoughts. So that's the first one. The second one um, folks might be familiar with as well. Um, this is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, also known as CSSRS, or folks could also call it just the Columbia. And it's basically the same questions as the crisis check sign one that I just walked you through, um, but a little more in depth. And it asks specifically about in the past month, have you dot, 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 um, whatever the question is, and you would check yes or no. I shared. Um, here on the left side about receiving training or downloading those screening tools, you could go to that website um, and download any of those. They have community cards that are specific to um, youth. Some are for um, like faculty and staff. Some are for coaches. And it's all the same questions, but on the flip side, it's just a picture of whatever the audience referenced is. Um, so that's a great resource, and they also, like I mentioned, provide training. So you could download their PowerPoint, walk through that training by yourself, or connect about a more formal training for your organization. Um, and then lastly, I was never personally trained through um, Is Path Warm, but this is what the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline uses. And they break it down by um, ideation, substance abuse, and then path is the purposeless, purpose, yeah, sorry, purposeless, anxiety, trapped, um, hopelessness, and then warm is withdrawing, anger, recklessness, and mood changes. So this one seems a little bit more involved, but if folks are trained through it, they're already familiar with it, um, you can continue to use it. So I just think it's important to offer a variety of options. We know, um, that the Columbia, the one I talked about right before, the CSSRS is evidence-based and we use this for our zero suicide training. So we'll be training healthcare organizations on this this summer um, and offering additional trainings throughout the year. But just for a simple one, it's the first one that I mentioned through the crisis text line, just thoughts, plan, means, and time frame. So that's a lot of information. Um, I can pause for questions if anybody has any. All right. Respond, um, present hope and alternatives to suicide. So th these kind of seem basic as we're, you know, doing this training right now, but when you're in the moment, you know, these are kind of harder things to remember. So it's important to listen to the person and give them your full attention. I have listen in all caps because sometimes it is incredibly difficult to just listen and not or trying to different live for the next to um I don't know how many people are familiar with Brene Brown but she has the the TED talk and talks about um silver lining things so when people say you know I really feel suicidal 
and we would automatically want to identify these reasons to live and say like, oh, but you have your family, you have your friends, you have your pets. Um, that's all important and really good, but you're silver lining in before um, you even listen to you know, what that person has to say. So it's important to pause, listen, don't rush to judgment. And then when they're in a place to talk about identifying reasons to live, then begin identifying those reasons to live. And you can do that through a safety plan. You can do that through apps. So I'll share about those in a little bit. All right, show empathy and compassion and then offer hope in any form. Um, and a piece that I read recently um, really has got me thinking about uh, the whole idea of hope and that um, we can reframe hope. Um, so there's a piece titled When Rage Eclipses Hope and it's about a suicide attempt survivor um, who is kind of sick of the hope narrative and sick of you know having to give these presentations about her suicide attempt and then wrap it in this little bow about hope and tell everybody that like she's good, um, she's not suicidal anymore because the truth is that she continues to deal with suicidal thoughts and her story at that moment when she's presenting is not always a super hopeful ending, um, but she knows that she wants to stay alive and she will do you know, everything she can to stay alive. So it's kind of a critical perspective on suicidology. Um, and it, it reminds me that we don't have to wrap everything in this bow of hope. You know, people have different reasons for staying alive and it's just, important for us to recognize that when we're, we're meeting with people who are suicidal, um, sitting through that and being uncomfortable with that and then helping them in whatever way makes sense to them. All right, so I mentioned safety planning. This is our evidence-based um, tool that we use for safety planning. It's called the Stanley and Brown Safety Plan Template. Um, step one, you would walk through folks to develop, I'm sorry, not develop, identify warning signs for them specifically. So what are their thoughts, uh, you know, images, mood, situation, behavior, other people who might be triggers for them, um, those warning signs that a crisis may be developing. And then you don't fill this out for someone. You work alongside with someone, alongside someone to fill this out for themselves. And then step two, identify internal coping strategies. So things I can do to take my mind off problems without contacting another person. So this could be like taking a walk, um, sitting by the water. Um, they also have those examples in there about a relaxation technique or physical activity. So again, these are without contacting another person. And then moving on to number three, people in social settings that provide distraction and you would put their phone numbers right in there and the places, whether that's like a coffee shop or a park, um, they can be creative. Step four, uh, people whom I can ask for help. So the name of the people they ask for help with their phone numbers. Step five, professionals or agencies I can contact during a crisis. And then six is making the environment safe. So asking about previous suicide attempts, if they um, identify the method that they used for the previous suicide attempt, asking about that again, if they've used um, whatever it is, just asking about that again and making sure wherever they're currently living or whoever they're with, um, making sure they don't have access to that in a moment of crisis. And then finally, at the very bottom, you can see the one thing that is most important to me and worth living for is, and then they fill that out. So that's a patient. One quick question. Yep. Is this a form that people can use at their agencies or is it, um, like, is it modifiable and yeah. Yep. So you can just Google um, patient safety plan template. I think I might also have it on the Prevent Suicide Wisconsin website. And you can download it and use it as is, or you could also uh, modify it. I know they have some of these modified specifically for youth. Um, hmm. So you're welcome to use this version or, or, or modify it. Great. Thanks. So building off of that idea of safety plans, um, there are some apps that you can download if you have a smartphone. Um, this first one is not specific to suicide. So the orange box with the example about use the 15 minute, this is called Calm Harm. So C-A-L-M and then H-A-R-M. Um, and it developed um, out of the UK and it's about self-harm. So things to do, and they 
they, they use the quote, like ride the wave of that urge to cut or self-harm. Um, what are things you can do instead of that? So there are distractions that you can click on um, that are 15 minutes or five minutes. And you can also put your contacts in there as well. So who is someone you can call um, if you're feeling like self-harming? So I found that one very helpful. I've shared that one with friends. And then the Virtual Hope Box is an evidence-based um, safety plan app developed by the VA. So it's called Virtual Hope Box, and it has similar things, uh, but a little more involved. Um, you can see those four boxes, the Distract Me, Inspire Me, Relax Me, and Coping Tools. So that one is also for iPhones and Androids. I think all three of these are, are for both. And then my three is a pretty basic My Safety Plan app. So they have the same thing as that Stanley and Brown Safety Plan had. So warning signs, coping strategies, distractions, network, and keeping myself safe. And these are all really easy to use. I know they have a lot of apps out there and we you know, have been having conversations about how do we vet you know, all of these apps and offer these all. But we've kind of came up with these three as the, as the really good ones. And I'm always um, welcoming more, um, but it kind of gets overwhelming when there's so many different apps out there. So these are the three main ones, Calm Harm, Virtual Hope Box, and then my three, um, my safety plan. So we have one more question. Yep. Uh, about the last slide. Uh, do you have to be in person to complete the safety plan? Most of my job is telebased. Can I walk through the plan over the phone with the client? Yeah, I mean, ideally you would do it in person, but a lot of this stuff is over the phone. Like even with crisis text line, that's also texting. Um, but you can definitely walk someone through this over the phone and they could even just get like a blank sheet of paper and you would just ask. All that's right. definitely something you could do. Thanks. Yep. All right. So I've mentioned this throughout. Um, and we know this is obviously really controversial because we're talking about guns, um, but we know and data shows that crises can be brief, um, sometimes undertaken with little planning. An important statistic to know is that 82% of youth die by suicide via gun in the home. So of youth who have died by suicide via gun, um, that gun was actually in the home. And we, we've had conversations um, with healthcare providers who haven't had a conversation with patients about Know whether or not they have a gun in the home. And if they do, that's fine. It's just important to, to lock it up, keep it in a safe, um, make sure it's hidden um, so that you don't have access to that. Uh, we also know that 90% of people who survive a suicide attempt do not go on to later die by suicide. We know that since it's a risk factor, a previous attempt, um, many do still go on to reattempt, but we know that data shows, and this is recent data that shows 75% of people who survive a suicide attempt never actually reattempt. So while it's a risk factor, um, this is what the data is saying. So we know that if we could um, substitute with less lethal means and increase somebody's likelihood to survive a suicide attempt, you have additional time to work with them on a safety plan, on their recovery plan, um, and have like a second chance um, at life, essentially. Um, lock, monitor, or discard unused medications. Temporarily store guns out of the home. For example, um, police departments, some police departments can hold on to them. Um, even some gun clubs and gun shops. I mentioned the gun shop project, um, or friends or relatives. So any way to creatively you know, store a gun outside of the home, somewhere safe, it's really important when somebody's in crisis. And uh, most importantly, we can ask about this. We hear over and over again when we do our zero suicide trainings in Wisconsin that healthcare providers are really nervous to ask about um, guns in the home because they don't want to come across as judgmental about anything. But we offer a course called Counseling on Access to Lethal Means. So that's CALM, um, where it really walks through walks people through how do we have this conversation with our patients, with our clients. Um, this is complicated to talk about because we know people might get upset, but how do we have these conversations without judgment and with the goal of um, keeping people safe when they're in crisis. I wanted to 
screenshot from the crisis text line um, referrals website. So if you go to crisistextline.org backslash referrals, they have a super user friendly um, directory that's alphabetized for all different resources. So I'm just showing you an example here. I typed in sexual assault and these are the organizations that came up. There were some more as well, um, but this is just an example of how you just type that in on the website and it pulls up some of these national organizations and shows you the ages, the demographics, um, what kind of resource is it, I mean, that information so that you don't have to go digging <laughs> for some of these resources. These are some crisis resources. So folks may have heard of a lot of these. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-TALK. Um, many people don't know that the website is also a resource though. And I didn't know that before I started this job. You know, I just knew that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline existed. But if you go to that suicidepreventionlifeline.org site, they have stories of lived experience, they have glossary of terms, um, all different resources. And they're also, they have a chat feature and they're um, ever expanding. So if you have not checked that out already, I would definitely suggest doing that. And it's pretty easy to navigate as well. The Veterans Crisis Line is that exact same number, but you would just press one. So anytime you call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, it, um, an automatic voice prompts you and asks if you're a veteran. Um, so if you're not, you would just hang on the line and then um, talk with whoever's able to answer. But for veterans, you would press one and you'll be connected to another veteran who is trained through the crisis line. And then we also have the Trevor Lifeline for LGBTQ youth. So that number is there, or you could also text Trevor to that number. Um, but do note that they're different, that the line, um, the phone line is different than the text line. Um, and I, I remember an announcement coming out recently, folks may have seen this, um, about the Trevor Lifeline hours expanding. I don't know, the website should have the information, but I know previously the text hours were only a certain, certain number of hours, but now they've expanded to um, more hours so that when people are texting in, they won't have wait times and they won't have to wait until, you know, quote unquote business hours for a crisis counselor to respond. And then lastly, are any of these lines, any of these, are any of these lines bilingual or multilingual? Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, does have a Spanish line. So on the top of the website, in the right hand corner, you'll see that Spanish number for the National Lifeline. Um, and they also contract with some translation services. So you would um, connect with that person who initially answers, um, tell them the language, and then they immediately work with the translation service to either um, send you to a translator or I'm not, I'm not sure what they do in the interim if they can't find someone. But that's a really great question. And, an issue that we run into a lot because you know most of these lines are primarily in English. Thanks. So the crisis text line, you would text Hopeline um, if you are a Wisconsin resident to seven four one seven four one, or you could search those crisis text line referrals that I shared. Um, and a little bit about the Hopeline keyword partnership. So. If folks are unfamiliar with Crisis Text Line, um, a little bit of background. They partner with states and corporations and nonprofit agencies to develop um, Crisis Text Line keyword partnerships. So in Wisconsin, the Center for Suicide Awareness owns the Hopeline word and has kind of been tasked with spreading this keyword to the rest of the state so that when people are texting in Hopeline to 741741, we can capture that data and we can look at who, you know, who is texting in, um, what are the demographics, and these are all um, self-reported, self like the survey that comes after you text into the text line, um, it, it asks you to complete a survey. And so then we can look and see the demographics, what the issues were, um, some spike times when, when we have really high volume, and then even days of week. So we know like in Wisconsin, for example, Tuesday is a really busy day of the week for the crisis tech sign. Um, and there's more information about that on the Center for Suicide Awareness website and also the crisis tech sign website if you're interested. 
And then I talked a little bit about the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, it provides 24 seven free and confidential support for people. Um, what happens when you call the lifeline? Basically you hear an automated message that features those additional options like the veteran crisis line. Then you hear music while they connect you um, to the local crisis center. And then number three, a trained crisis center counselor answers the call and helps you. They'll offer you referrals for mental health services if needed. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that Wisconsin actually has four National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Centers. So folks um, in county who work for county crisis lines can opt into being a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Center, but that means they will receive more um, suicide calls. So that's kind of um, complicated in the way, you know, do we have the capacity to answer if we sign on to be a center? Uh, but it's important to know that we have four in Wisconsin. So when people call, they'll probably talk to someone in a different state, but then when it's imminent risk, they would then route it to one of those centers in Wisconsin, and we would better know the local resources. Um, if you um, have time to identify your local crisis line, you can go to the Prevent Suicide Wisconsin website, uh, click on county crisis lines, just type in the county name, and you'll automatically get that county crisis line. So that would eliminate the need to call the national lifeline and get it routed to county. You could just directly connect with the county crisis line. Um, and I also wanted to share that a myth is that you personally have to be suicidal to call. I mean, I, I believed this. I thought that, you know, I couldn't call for a friend or a family member because I'd be like um, tying up the line for people who really need it. But you can call as um, someone who's trying to support someone and they can walk you through what to do and what the resources are in your area. So the fact is that you can call for a friend or, or with a friend for that matter. If you're with someone and they don't want to call, um, you can call together and talk to the crisis counselor. Um, back to the screenshot, uh, the Lifeline also offers Lifeline chat. Uh, they have options for deaf and hard of hearing people, the veterans crisis line that I mentioned, and then the Spanish Lifeline. So that number there is at the very bottom, the 888-628-9454. And again, this screenshot is pulled from the Prevent Suicide Wisconsin website but this information is also on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline site. All right, so imminent risk. I talked about helpful resources, crisis resources. So imminent risk, when someone answers yes to all four of those questions about you know, thoughts, plans, means, and time frame, um, it's important to know that we call 911 as a last resort. So the truth, Truth is that suicidal thoughts are common and we don't have to call 911 if someone's just having suicidal thoughts. It gets more serious is when uh, people have a plan and they have means and they know exactly when they would attempt suicide. So um, when you do call 911, um, when it is imminent risk, ask for a mental health or a crisis intervention team trained officer. Uh, we know we're working in Wisconsin to get folks trained through crisis intervention. Um, but we know we definitely have a lot of work to do and that law enforcement, if not trained in suicide prevention or um, de-escalation, um, can be more problematic than not calling sometimes. Um, so it's really important to communicate as much as you can about the situation before first responders actually arrive. Um, so again, if it's imminent risk, these are things that we need to do. We do need to call 911. We do need to call um, law enforcement, if law enforcement is the only option. Um, but there are things that we can do beforehand, which is why I talked about um, safety planning and those assessment tools prior to talking about imminent risk. This is a new resource from Ursula Whiteside. Um, she's a researcher and a person with lived experience. And she developed the website that's based on DBT skills, so dialectical behavioral therapy skills called nowmattersnow.org. And it's full of website, I'm sorry, uh, full of stories and videos from people who have been suicidal and what they've done uh, to get through suicidal thoughts um, and urges to kill themselves. This is just like a screen grab of the kind of protocol that she developed. This is being studied currently. Um, and so if you're working with people who are chronically suicidal and it's not just like a one-time crisis, um, these are things that you can share with them. 
So basically, number one, she calls it her stop, drop, and roll technique. Like, you know, when we're, when there's a fire, you know, there's things we learn as a kid to do to avoid being harmed in this fire. But what happens, you know, when we're kind of emotionally, quote unquote, on fire? So basically, shut it down. Number two, no important decisions. And number three, make eye contact. So she talks about this um, in her uh, a podcast with Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas. Um, so it's a really good podcast if you want to check it out. Otherwise, these are kind of the cliff notes, um, the what to do if you have an overwhelming urge to kill yourself. Um, so it's very interesting. It's very new. Like I said, it's still being studied. Um, but if you work with someone who's chronically suicidal and you really, you know, kind of running out of options, this is something you can just like print out and give to them, talk them through it. Um, we found it's a pretty good resource. So I've shared a lot of information um, and I have a lot more, but what I think uh, will be the most helpful is walking you through the preventsuicidewi.org website. Um, so everything I've mentioned is on the website. So is it okay if I just click on this link? Yep, that's fine. Don't mind the sidebar. I'm an admin for the website, so this is just kind of like my, my admin side. I'll hide that. Link. It's a little cleaner. Um, I basically wanted to walk people through the Find Help tab. So if you just click on the tab as is, you'll see the screenshot I shared about the Lifeline, um, Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and all these hyperlink to the resource listed. And then I have those additional resources down below. I mentioned the county crisis lines, so that's also under find help. You just click on your county, find the line. Um, suicide loss support. So I said that I would talk a little bit about postvention. Postvention is when someone dies by suicide, what are the prevention efforts that we can put in place to prevent additional suicides and how do we support a community when there is a death by suicide? So you can download this spreadsheet, um, suicide loss support groups in Wisconsin. There are um, faith-based groups listed and then loss survivor resources. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline has some great resources and then AFSP, which is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, has some really solid resources as well. So a lot of these just link um, to external sources, but I've got it all here in one place. Um, so that folks aren't super overwhelmed um, when something, uh, when, if someone dies by suicide and you're just trying to find some resources really quick. So you can scroll through that later if you're interested. And then attempt survivor support. I personally get calls um, so often from families who um, their child has attempted and they're looking for groups. So they're not lost survivors, but they really want to be able to help their family through an attempt. And we know um, Alternatives to Suicide is the name of a group that we could have throughout Wisconsin, but we just need the infrastructure to bring it and the facilitators and the funding and all that. So stay tuned. But right now, um, we do have one Alternatives to Suicide group that meets on the second and fourth Thursday of every month in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, and, and I have that little line underneath there about information on how to bring a group to your area. That's the um, kind of like the parent organization or alternatives to suicide. And then some PDFs of taking care of yourself, a family member um, after treatment in the emergency department after a suicide attempt. So lots of really good resources, lots of reading. I just wanted to show you those, um, the learn tab, and then get involved. So a lot of local coalitions do really great work. We have a whole directory of our local coalitions, so you can click on those. They have the contact information of the coalition leader. And then um, the e-newsletter, we only send out um, e-newsletters like once a month with statewide resources and upcoming suicide prevention events. This has a whole directory for the QPR gatekeeper training. So if you are thinking, you know, this webinar is nice, but what more can we do and how do we bring this to our communities? Um, you can search by county where the QPR instructors are and then contact the QPR instructor and they can come and provide a free um, suicide prevention training for you. So they're listed there. 
Um, and those are basically the main things. There's a lot more, but those are kind of the main things that I wanted to walk you through. Um, we had the lifeline number at the top and then the crisis text line number at the top as well. Um, and we are also on Facebook and I manage our Facebook page. So um, if you forget everything, um, <laughs> if you find Prevent Suicide Wisconsin on Facebook and you message that, um, I can connect with folks that way as well and provide resources as needed. So that's the website. Um, and lastly, um, thank you. So I have this video link. I won't share the video um, right now. I don't need to play it, but if you are interested, um, To Write Love on Her Arms is an amazing organization and they put together a World Suicide Prevention Day video every year. And so um, a lot of times I tailor our suicide prevention month and week activities around that video and around that theme um, because it really is kind of rooted in lived experience and people sharing their stories with suicide attempts and recovery. Um, and so last year's theme was Tomorrow Needs You, um, and it's kind of a cool way to wrap up in-person presentations. So that's just a resource for you. And then I have my email again, um, the Prevent Suicide Wisconsin website, and then Mental Health America of Wisconsin's website. So they also have a ton of resource directories that you can click through. So that is all I have. Thank you so much for letting me share this information on the webinar. Um, and then I can open for questions if there are any questions in the chat or if folks um, are able to verbally say them, um, whatever is best. So thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Leah. Um, I'm gonna uh, encourage folks to take this time to type into their chat or the Q&A box if you have some questions for Leah. Um, in the meantime, I think we do have one that Peter's going to share. Yes. Okay. So what if, what if you have a caller that is in imminent danger of committing suicide, but they're calling from a private number? Can you still call 911 with minimal personal information? Yeah, so that's really difficult, and I get this question a lot because first responders run into this a lot. Um, typically, law enforcement and 911 one can ping people's phones, even if it is a private number, they can still figure out how to access um, their location. I don't know the details of that. Um, I, should, I should figure that out so I have more information to share. But yes, I would still um, call 911, you know, share the information that you have available, share that it's a private number. But, you know, say it's in my desk and if you could ping the phone, ping the phone and locate that person for a welfare check. Awesome, thank you, Leah. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of other questions rolling in right now, but um, I do have another question, Leah. Um, I know that one of the things, especially when somebody's in imminent danger, the the you know recommendation is to call 911. Um, and I was just curious uh, in terms of what that response looks like, especially for people of color. I know we have a lot of conversations about um, you know not calling the police, for example, in situations with people of color, just because it can put them into further danger. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of hear your comments on that, especially in the context of suicide prevention specifically. Yeah, definitely. I'm so glad you raised this. I, like I mentioned, we have so much work to do um, because you're right, it can be more problematic and more harmful to involve law enforcement um, when someone's imminent risk, especially um, if say they, they plan to use a gun to kill themselves and we know anecdotally that you know suicide by cop exists um, and people talked about this at the american association of suicidology conference um, in denver a month ago um, and there are people really pushing to like completely you know divest in the in the police and actually invest into uh community responders so i don't know if we know what that looks like yet i think it's promising um, i think need a lot of funding and the mental health system just needs a lot of work. So I wish that I had uh, better answers for that. But I know that we deal with that in Milwaukee all the time. And that's why folks will call me, even though I'm not a crisis responder. Um, they'll say, you know, we're willing to call law enforcement because, you know, this happened last time. Like, what's a way to get somebody help without having to involve law enforcement? And so you can, depending on the relationship, you could um, go with someone too an emergency room or to a peer-run respite if a peer-run respite is near. Um, but sometimes 
that's complicated too because you know we're on the phone with people we're texting people we don't have that personal relationship and there are you know boundaries there so sorry that i'm just talking about it i wish that i had you know more specific answers i have lots of ideas <laughs> but um yeah yeah critical suicidology is kind of an emerging subfield of the suicidology field and there are a lot of um, people of color who are also people with lived experience talking about alternatives to um, police involvement um, when people are at risk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate your thoughts on that. I know it's, it's really complex and in many ways there's not a, probably a better solution right, right now, right? <laughs> um, but it sounds like there's some things in the works and um, I just appreciate your, your you know, thoughts on a, on a complicated question. Yeah. Um, so we do have another couple of questions. Go ahead, Peter. Um, is it safe to assume that the resources that can be found in other language, like in Spanish, and can you recommend a good safety plan that um, is printable in Spanish? I've found some that are not as good as the ones in English. Yeah, um, I actually don't know of a safety plan in Spanish right now off the top of my head. I've you know, I'm hoping they exist, but that's something we can easily develop. Um, cut that out afterwards if I find something. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Awesome. I'm not seeing any other questions rolling in at this time. Um, so I just want to say thank you again, Leah, for, for spending some time with us this morning, for sharing your, your expertise and your insight. Um, sounds like there could be some follow-up with maybe some more Spanish resources afterwards, and we'd really greatly appreciate if you if you find something, Leah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you again for, for being with us, um, for being a resource for people on this subject. We, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me.